Now we're going to talk about waterproofing and sealing. A lot of our clients come to us with small gadgets. A year or two ago, it was all the fashion. Everyone wanted to do a responding widget that did something or another. They all wanted it to be waterproof. So at least you could take a shower. And some of them wanted you to be able to swim with it because it's a fitness device. Waterproofing is um, some harder than some people think. Um, we got the, the Pebble Watch waterproof to five atmospheres, and it was a lot of work because the Pebble has uh, four or five buttons with that operate their, their pushers. So there's actually a stainless steel shaft that's a slide through a seal. Those are always the hardest to, to seal, especially if you're operating the button in the water. You might drag water through the seal. And then you also have other issues like so you have controls across the the boundary. You have charging contacts. You have to be able to charge it. Those have to be waterproof. And then you've got the joints between the different parts of the housing. In the case of something like a pebble watch, you've got a crystal, you've got the crystal to the top housing, top housing to the main housing, a battery contact, and so on. So pretty demanding. So there's a um, set of waterproofing standards. Most people uh, work with IP ratings, and they go all the way from IP2, where basically it can take a little bit of mist and anything more than that. All the way to IP? Uh, ingress protection. And there's two numbers. The X has to do with keeping dust and dirt out, which we're not dealing with today. Uh, so we're saying IPX7, it means something else for dirt, dirt, dirt and dust, but a 7 rating for water. So for example, they say a 7, 30 minutes at depth of 1 meter is still water, and an 8, I think it's uh, yeah, continual submersion. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind, 1 meter is not very deep. Uh, IP7 would probably take care of showering. It might not be good enough for diving off a diving board. And it's certainly not good enough for scuba diving. And so this scale pretty much stops before really waterproof watches start. And the other th important thing is people look at this and say, well, geez, IP3 ought to be good enough. Spraying 60 degrees of vertical, 10 degrees per minute, and that's aggressive. I'll be fine for a vertical. It's not, you know, you take a shower, you go swimming, it's, it's going to fill with water. Um, the other thing is you've got to worry about uh, even just uh, movement of water vapor. Think of that pusher operating through the seal. You could bring a very thin film of water through the seal because the thinner the film, the greater the adhesion force. You bring it through to the inside, now it turns into water vapor in the crystal fogs. It might have been a gajillionth of a, of a liter of a drop of water, but it's enough to fog the crystal. So a lot, you've got to be a lot more stringent than you might otherwise guess if you don't have experience. So uh, generally uh, uh, designed to a very high standard and promised to a very low standard is probably a good uh, policy to, to follow. Some of the things you got to think about when you're working on this, you know, is it a waterproof container that's closed all the way around? You know, like a, a bottle or a tank, it's a closed surface, that's pretty easy. Do you have to be able to open it? You know, do you have a battery that has to be replaced? Uh, things have to cross the, the boundary, like those pushers that we talked about. You look at a caster and the way these work, these are over-molded buttons. They're actually in one with the plastic housing, and there's little tack switches on the circuit board behind it. So there's no moving anything. It's actually one single surface. And it's just that some that can flex and can actually the buttons behind it. You know, once inside, there will always be some water vapor that gets in there. You know, plastic is itself partially permeable to water vapor, and the water vapor will move from areas of high concentration to low. So there are going to be some. So even if you have a water, quote unquote, waterproof container, you may want to conformally coat the circuit board. You may want to dip it in epoxy. Think about how the parts are held together. People say, oh, I have these two housing halves, I'll have an O-ring between them. I don't even think the fact that the clamping force on an O-ring, this diameter, say 32nd of an inch size O-ring, maybe six or seven pounds to compress that entire O-ring sufficient for a seal. And you, you got really thin wall plastic, and I think I'll have four screws. And four screws can't compress that O-ring, now four tiny little, you know, 00-56 screws. So clamping force is important. Um, and that's especially if you're compressing a face seal, we'll talk about it a little bit. Face seals require a lot of camp, clamping pressure. If you can go to a circumferential seal, then you take care of this, the clamping force of the hoop stress, and you don't have to clamp it. With <coughs> so that's mostly how it works. If you, once, if you take uh, uh, unscrew the back off a good watch, you find the O-ring is not being compressed by the screw on the back. It goes on a plug that's part of the, the uh, watch back, and it's on the circumference, so it fits inside of a, a cylindrical bore. And you actually, in fact, a watch shop will use a kind of an arbor press to press it in, and then they tighten it uh, with the threads. Okay, types of seals. Uh, an O-ring is one of the first ones people uh, think about. O-ring's got to be compressed. It goes in a groove. Uh, you've got to compress it just the right amount. Uh, and when you're dealing with small O-rings, if that's you know, 35 thousandths in diameter, which is I think what a 132nd series O-ring is, and you may want to compress it 15%, 
say for a seal that can be removed without a permanent set in the O-ring, you're talking there like four and a half thousandths of an inch. You've got a tolerance on the O-ring manufacturer itself, a tolerance on the depth of this hole, and so you've got an assembly where you can't tolerate more than about a thou of variation. So you've got to be able to build this, 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 this groove and this cover and everything with no more than plus or minus half a thousandth of an inch variation to make this O-ring seal work. O-ring seals are all about uh, tolerances. Uh, there are types of O-ring seals. There's a face seal. That's where the O-ring is compressed when you bring the two pieces together. It requires a lot of clamping force. You can, you can compress it, say, 15% for a removable seal. You can go up to 30% for a permanent seal. It'll give you a good seal, but you've got to throw the O-ring away and put a new one in every time you take it apart. Uh, there are circumferential or gland seals. That's where the seal is on the exterior, and it pushes inside a cylindrical board. Uh, that has the advantage of not requiring a clamping force. They can be tricky to put together. Those can be dynamic. They move. Think of a, you've seen little air cylinders that operate under compressed air. There's an O-ring seal inside the output fitting. Sometimes not an O-ring, sometimes something else. And the rod slides through it. Tolerances are extremely important there. They're very picky, or it can be static where it doesn't move. That's less picky. Um, the grooves can be a rectangular groove, like I showed. It can be a full dovetail or a half dovetail. Dovetail grooves have the advantage of retaining the O-ring. Uh, all the semiconductor processing equipment I used to build, we have O-rings. I mean, you know, 10 running feet of O-ring around this funky uh, chamber, and a big lid that comes off on a hoist. And O-rings are sticky, especially when they've been compressed and subjected to high temperatures. You don't want the O-ring to be torn out of the groove when you pull the lid off. So you get it in half dovetail or a full dovetail that retains it. A lot of factors that affect sealing performance is the dimensions, the percent compression I talked about. First surface finish of the groove, if it's too coarse, air leaks, because air will travel through the little valleys of the uh, of the lay of the grain. Uh, the direction of the grain, if the grain goes perpendicular to the O-ring, it's making little tunnels for the air to pour water to get through. If it goes along with the O-ring, if you make it follow the O-ring perfectly, then the teeth of the grain bite in the O-ring, you actually get a better seal than if it's a mirror finish. These first few are probably the most important. People who have designed O-ring groove, they think I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I'll design the groove myself inevitably. They design it for too much compression, that groove's too narrow, the O-ring's captured on all four sides, and it becomes an incompressible liquid in the lid wound close. The long and short of it is you get the, the, uh, the uh, Apple rubber catalog or the uh, Parker. Or my, hmm? Parker. Parker, that's who I was trying to think of. And they have a, a tremendous technical manual and you follow their instructions to the letter. And uh, you don't change, don't go away from that until you've had 20 years experience and even then somebody should slap you if you try. Um, chemical compatibility. Uh, obviously you don't want an O-ring that reacts with the fluid. And people think, oh, I'll just get generic black O-ring. Well, you've got neoprene, nitro, and buna N, and two of those are the same, and I always forget which ones. Uh, they look identical, they're black. One of them doesn't like water, and the other one doesn't like petroleum. So you can't swap it, you gotta get them right. Okay, entrapment of fluid behind the O-ring, especially in dovetails. You get a space between the O-ring and the corner of the dovetail. It can even happen in a rectangular groove. And it, it's more important in vacuum chambers. You trap air there, you pump it down, all of a sudden the O-ring shifts, it lets, lets out the air, and your process is trash. Dynamic seals, with O-rings especially, they're very tricky. As you're moving the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, say, a shaft through an O-ring seal, and it's worse for a rotating shaft, whereas up with, with a linear translating shaft, you're, at least you're exposing the O-ring to new cool sections of stainless. But uh, with a rotating shaft, you're heating the O-ring, there's friction. And uh, if the gland is in the exterior part and the shaft is rotating in it, which is usually the case, uh, the last words have a negative coefficient of thermal expansion. You heat them, they get smaller. And so you start heating that O-ring, so it clamps on the shaft, so it gets that much hotter, so it clamps on the shaft, until literally it's smoking. And, and the, the, it's a matter of thousandths of an inch there, so you have to be very careful. Which is why, actually, for a lot of rotating applications, you don't use O-rings, you use uh, lip seals or X seals, and things like that. Uh, lubrication, most seals should be lubricated. Uh, dry seals are hard to design, possible, but it, they're tough. Contamination, you get dirt in there, it's going to trash the seal, you get hydrocarbon on the wrong kind of... Uh, Lubricated uh, with what? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, whatever, it has to be something the O-ring is compatible with. So uh, if I remember right, uh, Buna and is, it likes hydrocarbon just fine, so you just slather it with lithium, lithium grease and you're fine. Uh, but nitro, and I may have these reversed, uh, will s swell and, and extrude and crack if you do that. So you have to use like a silicone grease. Silicone pretty much won't hurt most O-rings. There are others, there's a gajillion compounds. And the Parker catalog will tell you all about them. You know, my, I typically use Viton because it resists almost everything and it's a mechanically robust 
uh, and with a good hard finish. And, and uh, when you install it, you're not likely to shear off pieces of it on the edge. Um, for high temperature, you go to silicone, but that's not mechanically robust. And so on. It's, it's a whole field all its own. Um, temperature, uh, I mentioned silicone. Uh, I used to have to seal high temperature chambers, and so it was always a struggle to cool the o ring. Most of your products will probably not be heating their o rings to over 200 degrees centigrade as I was, so probably not a problem. And the most important rule get the park and the Apple rubber o ring handbook and follow its instructions. And if you're ever using an o ring, that, that will get you where you need to go. Okay, permanent joints. So you got the case halves that got to go together or the crystal on a watch. Uh, you can do ultrasonic welding if the part's small enough. Uh, and what ultrasonic welding does, you have the two parts held together in a fixture <coughs> and you, use, you have a, a, a device that generates uh, ultrasonic sound very high intensity and transmits it through the interface. And the interface between the two parts, you have basically like re, you know, acoustic resistance, not unlike thermal resistance, and the plastic melts. And you're usually applying force at the same time you force the parts together. Um, George design is particular. You can get scuffing of a surface, and it doesn't come apart afterwards except with a chisel. Uh, corners can be a problem uh, because of the way the sound echoes. Uh, vibration welding, we mostly don't see that. It's basically friction welding as it's spin welding. Laser welding, so you can send uh, IR laser right through one of the parts if it's transparent to the IR laser and uh, weld the interface. Uh, we did this iRobot, the, the scuba tank has uh, two sections in it, dirty fluid and clean fluid, so there's three parts. And uh, we uh, welded the top, mostly clear part, to the middle part with the uh, laser welding. And originally, you know, we had the, the top part, I think it was polycarbonate, was translucent. And the other part, we had to buy this special IR absorptive resin, I don't know, $6 a kilogram, um, from the company that made the laser welder, and we hated it. Until we figured out you could take, make the part out of cheap ABS and take a black sharpie and run it over the seam, put it together with the black sharpie worked great, and uh, weld it right together. And uh, then we'll skip ahead to hot plate welding. The other joint, we use hot plate welding. And in that case, what we have is a fixture held the two halves together, and there's this big chunk of metal machined to match the two parts with a heater inside. It heats up to about the melt temperature of the plastic. You bring the two plastic pieces down against the uh, hot plate until they start to melt. Pull them apart, yank the plate out, jam them together, and you get a weld. And if everything's set up just right, it actually does a very good job. We should have used hot plate welding for the laser welder. The laser welder, I swear, it was the only laser welder in all of China. And every time it broke down, we had to fly a guy in from uh, uh, some place in, in mid, the Midwest of the US. And we had to stock parts because there was no distributor. It was like one of the worst decisions we ever made. Oh, and only that, there was a, they did a software update. It was a bug in the software update because there's a big array of laser diodes. And all the energy is pumped down through fiber optics to a fixture. So you've got a, you know, I don't know, 128 fiber optic bundles directing laser energy. And there was a bug in the software. They flipped a bunch of laser diodes. So all the programming was wrong. And it took us forever to figure it out. Because, you know, some places were melting, other parts were welding. And you just couldn't figure out why. Solvent bonding. Uh, you take a solvent that will melt the plastic involved. You know, you put it on each part. You jam them together. They, they melt together. Um, can be messy, can be hard to do, can't join dissimilar plastics. Uh, it's a health hazard, depending on the solvent, it's a fire hazard, they used to use acetone. Um, temperature and humidity affected, it's, uh, we avoid it as much as possible. Uh, RF welding, typically if you're doing bladders and things like that, it must be avoided. So you get devices that you want to uh, uh, cover with plastic, typically a flexible plastic. Uh, but they've got solder joints. Most injection molded plastics have a melt temperature that's much higher than the melting point of solder. They're also very viscous and they're injected at well over 300, sometimes 400 psi. And because they're very viscous, there's a tremendous shear force as they flow through the mold. So first it melts the solder joints and that tears the components loose from the circuit board. And if you've got flex, it'll tear it in half and just destroy it. Don't just take a circuit board and uh, put it in a mold and fill it full of, of uh, injection molded plastic. So what they do is they'll typically do a first pass with a, a low temperature, a low viscosity uh, uh, material. It's, some of it is, is not unlike hot melt glue. And if you heat it, it just basically turns the water. And so you mold that around the circuit board. Then you take that and put a thin layer of a higher temperature elastor on top of it. And that first uh, layer protects the devices from heat and mechanically protect them from the shear force of the mold flowing. The Nike fuel band has three layers. There's the, the nylon based stuff, and then a, low, a medium temperature elastomer, and finally a stiffer. Uh, plastic exterior. 
the, the, the uh, Nike Fuel Band is, is basically a moonshot of a, a wearable, and there's a reason why they're pretty much have discontinued it. It's really hard to make. But if, if you want to learn about uh, over molding and, and uh, low temperature molding, buy one and take it apart and section it. It's, it's real interesting. Um, not just any wire, your freaking wires. Um, when you're waterproofing, uh, very common problem, you get a circuit board, you can formally coat it, you're going to put it in what we call a, uh, a Tupperware. This will be a molded container, usually it's part of your housing, and it gets a lid that goes on and that lid is glued on, but you got wires coming in and out. Now you could have waterproof bulkhead connectors on the wall of this thing, but those cost a fortune, as I mentioned, so you can't afford it. So typically you run them in through holes, or sometimes you run them in under and up, uh, and you pot up the dip, and so you're trying to pot the place where this flows in. You could just take a caulking gun full of RTV and squirt it in there, hope for the best. But if it's much of a bundle of wire, it's not going to work. There's going to be air gaps in the middle where you can't see the let water or air or whatever in and out. Uh, and we went through this problem with the scuba. So you've got to get the adhesive in there, the sealing agent. Uh, if you can, this is something where if you can pull a vacuum on it and yank the air bubbles out, it works great. Uh, very important is you need to have a sealing agent, an epoxy, whatever that bonds to the wires. I worked a long time ago for this company building ultrasonic inspection robots, inspected the inside of steam turbine bores, because a big steam turbine rotor weighs 75 tons, shaft part of it's this big in diameter, it's a hole right through the middle. Because when they ford it, there's, there's, there are bad inclusions that have migrated to the center, so they just bore it out. And so when you inspect that shaft, because this thing rotates, it's 3600 RPM, weighs 75 tons, <coughs> it's 15 feet in diameter with the blades, if it comes apart, it's like a small nuclear weapon. Uh, several people were killed in the UK in the early 70s when a turbine blade came apart at, at the Leeds Point uh, power station. And uh, uh, U.S. power stations required by law to have three feet of reinforced concrete over the turbines as a, a containment vessel. So it's pretty important to inspect these. So we fill, flood the bore with water and run a robot through that scans the steel from the inside for ultrasonics. It takes three days to do the scan because you're scanning with a resolution of 10 thousandths of an inch and it's 75 feet long and you're going out to about a meter. And uh, so you have all the cabling and everything has to stay on the water for you know most of a week. And we we're having a problem with this one connector. We had a connector of 400 mini coax come out. There's a big clamp on connector. It has, all has to fit inside this uh, three inch IV tube. And the, the connectors were corroding, even though everything was potted up. And so we got the uh, well, a sales rep from 3M that made the, the epoxy we used in. They were complaining to him about his no good friggin' epoxy that let the water in. And he looks at the cable assembly and says, you know, those wires, Got Teflon insulation on it? And we said yes, because Teflon gives you the thinnest insulation. Takes three seconds. He grabbed the wire and gave it a yank. He a piece of wire just blowing right out of a solid block of epoxy, because the epoxy did not wet the Teflon. And so there was a surface that wasn't wet, and the water could work its way through. And the, the answer was to go to a different insulation that the epoxy could wet, and then we were fine. 